back with another edition of Terry's Talkin' Cleveland.com podcast with award-winning columnist from the Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com, Terry Pluto, and me, your host, David Campbell. How's it going, Terry? I am well, David. Good. You know, um, it's crazy to think, but Christmas is coming up this weekend, and uh, here's our big story for the week. We've been doing a big story segment at the top, and I was curious about what the best Christmas songs of all time are. And I found this list on Billboard, and they actually had their staff rank the top five. So I thought I would run those past you and then see if you had a famous Christmas song. So here was their top five. I'm going to count down from five to one. You probably remember hearing some of these when you were a kid. Um, number five is Bing Crosby, White Christmas. An old classic, right? Number four, I was surprised by this one, Wham! Last Christmas from 1994. Number three is Nat King Cole's Christmas song. Um, a lot of people call it Merry Christmas to You, 1961. Mm, I like that one. Yeah. Number two, Darlene Love, Christmas Baby, Please Come Home. <laughs> Remember that one, 1963? Mm-hmm. You probably heard that one when you were yes. a kid. And can you guess what number one is, Terry? It was made in 1994, and she is doing a Christmas special this week on TV, I believe. I have no idea. Mariah Carey, All I Want for Christmas is You. So well, there's your top five, according to Billboard. So, Terry, you have to have some right. well, first Christmas of all, favorites. I'm a pop culture idiot and proud of it, so that knocks out all that. All right. Now I'm going to tell you, and I'm not only that, I'm going to tell you who sings them. And they're not going to be people that are well known. Uh, number one would be it's sort of a tie between my wife Roberta and uh, Gloria Williams, who's our partner in jail ministry. Gloria sings a song called "Mary, Did You Know," which is a very powerful uh, gospel song. I've heard that. Yeah. Yes. And then Roberta sings kind of two of them would be Come O Come Emmanuel. Roberta took 10 years of classical voice lessons, sings it a cappella, or she sings another song that I like. I got to bug her to make sure she sings it when we do the Haven of Rest on Christmas, Good King Wenceslas. So there you go. There's an old standby. I've heard both of those. Well, you're old. <laughs> That's pretty much true. Isn't Not it? as old so. as me, but you're old. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what did Terry, they sing in your Irish household growing up? <laughs> oh, all the old, all the old standbys. A few you mentioned there. Um, Little drummer boy, always a favorite. I like that one. I like that yeah. one too. Yeah, it's a good song. So when you get a good version of that, it's definitely worth listening to. So all right, Terry, the Cavs gave their fans an early Christmas present on Monday night. Maybe their best performance of the season, uh, one twenty-two to ninety-nine over the Jazz down at the Fieldhouse. They're twenty-one and eleven. Two games behind the Bucks as we taped this on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, did you think that was their best performance last night? Probably. I mean, the, the Jazz were a little bit, a little bit beat up in that. They didn't have Sexton and so on. But yeah, I mean, it's nice to see them win going away because I think they've been in five overtime games this year and a lot of close games. And well, I've been pleased to see, you know, Mitchell. I've, I think he played on twenty three minutes or something. They finally got him down to thirty six a game. Uh, which is, remember, he was close to 40. That was driving me nuts there for a while, but that's good to see it. But it was fun to kind of go back. In fact, it's um, I'm, I'm finishing up a column that will be published tomorrow, I'm, you know, looking back at the trade again. And one is, I remember one of the things when I was talking to different executives about it, uh, one of the executives told me, he said, you're overrating marketing. Because I said, I really wish they hadn't put him in there. And I guess what I'll say is, no, I, I wasn't. He's very good. It, I realize he was sacrificing a lot here, and he's averaging 22 and 8 for Utah. Now, that said, I underrated Mitchell quite a bit. I really did. Because I remember when they did the trade, and they go, it's a 20, pick in 25, a pick in 27, a pick in 29, and marketing, and Sexton, and Abaje or whatever his name was, the other first round thing. I'm going, are you kidding me? I just had no idea. I mean, I saw him play some good games, but Utah wasn't on TV that much. And my goodness, I mean, he is the package. And then the thrust of my column is that they got him at exactly the right time, David. He's 26 years old. So he's, this is his sixth year in the NBA. So he is at the right physical prime 
and his mind in terms of knowing the pro game with 39 games of playoff experience behind him, he's in the sweet spot and on a three-year contract. And as another executive um, said to me when I was talking about that, he goes, they got him on for three years. In the NBA, three years is an eternity. Everybody gets fired. Everybody jumps teams. Every, you get this guy for three years and put him in with that group, he goes, you got to do that. And if you got to trade a bunch of picks, you got to do it. And so a resounding yes from you, I'm, if you had to do that trade all over oh, again, a resounding a- yes. Absolutely. I'm finally moving. Chris Pedar is helping me too with this move more into how the modern NBA thinks. Um, and that this is, you just so much is out of your control. And when you can actually control these groups, I mean, Rick Carlisle the other day said, boy, do they have a lot of good, young, great players, just like that. And they do. They're all 26 and under, and they're all tied up for a few years at least. And they have the right coach. And we'll find out when it gets to playoff time, they get deep into playoffs. But I saw JB, I love the way he grumbles about defense. He sounds like an old man like me because he's talking about how great everything was. He goes, you know, we really didn't do a good job defensively parts of the second half. You know, it's like because he, he's not going to let him off the mat on that. Great, because this is what will carry the team deep into the playoffs is their defense. And then the other thing, as Mike Fratello told me when the trade was made, he said, Terry, look at it. He goes, I saw, I, he, I guess Mike, one of the playoff games he had, he saw him go for 50 in a playoff game. Mitchell's done that twice. So now, what, what, do you, what do you think, I'm going to ask you, how do you think Mitchell and Garland are doing now? I think pretty well. I think it's coming along. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that I liked last night, I mean, how many seven-footers in the league can you see running the floor like Jared Allen was running the floor Ugh, last night on the break? I, I mean, know. It, it seems like it's starting to come together. And we talked last week about this homestand they're on right now yeah. being, being an important part of the season for them where things are finally starting to catch a little bit, I think. Uh, I, and, you know, the story of last night was – Mitchell against his old team and Markinen against his old team. But I, I think this is this might be one of the moments of the season where the Cavs kind of understood their defensive identity a little bit. I mean, if you looked at our coverage today, like Will Hardy was talking about how the Cavs were stopped, were being so physical on defense that the Jazz couldn't get to their spots. Like they yeah. couldn't get where they wanted to be. They were trying to scream, but it wasn't hard enough. The Cavs were so physical mm-hmm. defensively. And I think this was one of the times this season where you saw the Cavs play defense. This is what GAB wants it to look like, regardless of whether he said they let down in the second half a time. Yeah. Or not. When the other team's coach, when Will Hardy is saying they, they out physicaled us and we couldn't run our offense, like that's a that's a pretty good compliment on how your team played. Now I'm getting these not too many, but I've gotten a couple emails from people about well the Cavs are playing at the slowest pace in the NBA. I don't care. They're still averaging like 106, 107 points, and they are the best overall defensive team. You could argue them or Milwaukee. It kind of goes back and forth on what analytics use. In other words, we're, we used to talk about them being awful. I remember at one press conference a few years ago, I said uh, something about that they were a deplorable defensive team. This is Kobe, Kobe Altman sitting there with JB. And I said, you were lasting about everything. And Kobe came up, well, it wasn't everything. Like there were a couple of things that were 29th out of 30th. So they were arguing. So whether we're arguing first versus second, it's a lot better than 29 versus 30. And I, I, I guess I'm thrilled with that. that you can't just run all over the place and expect your big men to, to do all the dirty work defensively under there. You have to wait for them sometime. You know, you want to go down it. Yeah, you get a break, you know, you get a layup, get a dunk. I'm still not as wild as some people are about everybody runs and just fans out and fires threes with nobody under the basket. But uh, I guess it depends who's shooting them. Uh, so, it's, but again, it's better. But what, what else do you see about Garland and Mitchell that you like? Um, well, and Chris Fito wrote about this today. I was actually going to ask you, Terry, like you see a lot of superstars join a team and they want the ball all the time and it's all about them mm-hmm. and and their image and their stats. And, and Donovan Mitchell has not been that. He's he's kind of been one of the guys from day one. And Chris Fito wrote about this today. And I, I think mm-hmm. that's another thing that separates him aside from his talent is just his 
his team attitude. And we, we talked about the culture, but I think that's another reason it's work. It's working is these guys are not fighting for shots. Um, it's starting to come in the flow of the offense. Well, he had a couple of advantages. Uh, unlike LeBron, it was always the franchise, you know, from about the ninth grade on. Uh, he was highly recruited, but not super duper recruit. Went to Louisville, stayed there two years, I believe. And uh, I have to check that as we're talking. But then he goes to Utah, and he can he really uh, – this was in that situation there with Quinn Snyder. That, that was a team, you know, a team approach there. Snyder's a really good coach. Some NBA teams should, should jump him up immediately. All that happened in Utah is they got to be really good and they couldn't get over the top in the playoffs. That was it. And I've watched it here. I've seen it elsewhere. It's kind of like it's nobody's fault. And probably is Mitchell was younger then, still learning what it takes, where now I think to go back, right time, right team, right spot, three years left on a contract, right coach. Um, it's still going to be hard to get by Boston and Milwaukee and all that, but you, we could talk about this now. And Mitchell's the reason we could talk about this. Had they kept marketing and not made the trade, they would be good, but they wouldn't be 21 and 11. And we would still be wondering who's really going to score here when things get tight in the playoffs. Yeah. And they didn't have anybody like him who could just muscle his way to the basket in crunch time. Like the, no. there was nobody who could take the ball at the top of the key and just get to the rim. And that Euro step he did last night. Like, <laughs> like how I know do you he stop comes that? <laughs> like, and then on top of that, it takes. It really takes a the pressure off of uh, off of um, Garland, and it allows him to kind of do some of the things that he does best. So uh, it's really been uh, it's been fun to see, and I'm glad Marker is playing well, and I'm glad Sexton's in a role that we hey, come off the bench 20, 25 minutes, put up some shots. You know, this is good for you. So I like all that, and I just. They're a likable team. They they combine the old school elements with with the modern game, and they just don't they don't seem to they don't say stupid stuff. They don't do stupid things. I know sometimes you get discouraged with the effort, but some of it is the product of the NBA. I mean, they got in there and they slugged out one one an ugly game with Dallas. You know that's that's always a challenge there. So we'll see. As it goes on, I used to mention they've got Milwaukee and some others coming in. I don't know. I'm just I'm just so glad they're good and they're relevant. I mean, watching the playing for ping pong balls is so bad. And one other thought came to me: you got to give Danny Ainge, who's, who's helping to run the the Jazz now, a lot of credit. He picks up three number ones in the Mitchell trade, four number ones for Rudy Gobert. His team is, I think, a game over 500. He's quote quote unquote tanking without tanking. In other words, he's got a relevant team, almost like the Guardians. You know, we're not going to be awful, and we're going to keep building for the future at the same time. Yeah, and they're 17 and 16. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Mark has got three years on his contract. I think uh, Sexton signed a four-year deal. I think they got Clarkson for a while. Um, Clarkson's always one of my kind of guys that I like, too. So it's I like that team. It's a good team. But Mitchell gives the Cavaliers a chance to be great. Yeah, and a couple stats I wanted to mention real quick, Terry. Even with all the defensive hand wringing that's happened so far this season, the Cavs rank heading into last night's game. They ranked first in the league in opponent points in the paint per yeah. game, forty-five point nine, and they're first in opponent second chance points per game at ten point nine. So, uh, you know, to hear JB say they hadn't hit really hit their defensive <laughs> stride until recently, like that's still that's not a bad foundation to build on so but jb wants to shut out the other team understand that <laughs> i mean he he does and the other some of the other numbers there that i think are are relevant is um you know opponents field goal percentage is real they're very good at that and just flat out holding the points the fewest points they are remember the nba the modern nba team the average team in this modern NBA, 113 points a game. I still have a hard time getting my head around that. So you start holding people under 100. I mean, that's like scoring 82 points in the old days. 
Yeah, it's not like the old 90s where you couldn't go to the mm. basket in the playoffs without getting no, uh, close no, on the whistles so. blow. And, yeah. Free by the way, and, we, you, know, you and I were on the traveling thing. I'm glad that, that bird flew away. It landed for one day in New York where they kept blowing the traveling whistles, and then it's gone. Yeah. I mean, call, so, call real traveling. They'll just call it. So, Terry, you mentioned uh, – so the Cavs have three games left on this homestand. Wednesday against Toronto, Friday against – I'm sorry. Wednesday, Milwaukee, Friday, Toronto, and then Monday, the day after Christmas, against Brooklyn. Milwaukee and Toronto have kind of been a nemesis for this team so mm-hmm. far. Are, are we going to learn anything about the Cavs these next two nights? Yeah, they know uh, how to what play. what do you want to see? They know how to play the Cavs. They go after them. They, they usually do a good job, especially when Garland was uh, – the primary ball hunter, trying to get it out of his hands. They'll still go after him and do it. Uh, Toronto is just as tenacious. They're not as gifted physically as the Cavaliers, but as tenacious defensively. And, uh, and Milwaukee is the champs. You know, they have that. So, yeah, I want to see how they match up against them. And I like how the Cavs are finding, like, different reasons to play the games. That's part of what you have to do during the regular season, you know. Okay, this one's for Donovan. Then before they were like, uh, Donk, you know, Donkic, what, what can they do with Luka? Can they shut him down? You know, match up with Milwaukee. You know, just just find different reasons to, to keep yourself interested. All right, Terry. Um, speaking of keeping yourself interested, why don't we take a break? And when we come okay. back, we'll talk about the Browns, who are finding reasons to stay interested in the rest of their season. And we'll talk about kind of what they're trying to accomplish these last few games. Uh, we've got some Guardians we can talk about. We've got some good Hey Terry questions. And we'll be right back on Terry's Talking. Calling all Ohio sports fans, in just a few weeks, DraftKings Sportsbook will be live. Starting January 1st, you'll be able to bet on all your favorite sports from the comfort of your own home with DraftKings. To celebrate, all new customers will receive $200 in free bets when you sign up today using code TALKIN. That's T-A-L-K-I-N. Plus, five lucky customers will win a $100,000 free bet. Just download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and sign up with code TALKIN to get $200 in free bets to use once mobile sports betting hits Ohio. Plus, five customers will win a $100,000 free bet. That's code TALKIN and only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-589-9966. 21 and over and physically present in Ohio. Eligibility restrictions apply. See terms at DraftKings.com slash sportsbook. Subject to regulatory licensing requirements, one per new customer, $200 issued as eight $25 free bets. No purchase necessary for sweepstakes, void where prohibited. Ends first day DraftKings is allowed to operate in Ohio. See terms and con- official rules at dkng.co slash oh. We're back on Terry's talking. Terry, the Browns are six and eight. They are really using these last few games to try and get Deshaun Watson up to speed. Uh, a nice cold win over the Ravens uh, mm-hmm. on Saturday. What did you think of Deshaun Watson? This is going to be like our weekly topic of discussion, but uh, better than the first two weeks. And it seems like he's starting to get this a little bit. Okay. First of all, I got emails from several people saying I made too much of the wind, you know, in my story in that. Well, maybe it wasn't that windy in Parma. I know this. When I left home in Akron to go to the game, it wasn't that windy. And then I got to the parking lot there by the lake, and I walked out the door, and I almost got slammed back into the car because the wind tried to close the door. I'm like, this, it was windy. When you're on the field in this 20 to 30 mile an hour wind, it is hard to throw it, and it changes how the game is played, not just in terms of the cold temperatures, but you know, when you see Justin Tucker couldn't quite get his things all lined up together, um, that was hard. Okay, so we set that. Then I turned around and looked, how did Deshaun play? I remember when Deshaun was up here in this cold weather game several years ago, he looked like he just wanted to go home. I mean, he really did not have a good time. He was mentally ready for that game. And while well, he threw a bunch of short and medium passes, good. That's how you do it and and he was surprisingly accurate. I mean he's got a strong arm. He was able to, you know, fire it through there. And so that was good. I, yeah, was I just impressed. wanted to mention real quick, Terry, the, uh Irie Harris, who covers the Brown one of our Browns mm-hmm. reporters, he put a, a a passing chart up after the game and he did not throw one pass twenty yards or further downfield the whole game the other day. Um, and if you see the graphic, it's pretty striking. And I think you're right. What the Browns are trying to do is was not make a big mistake. They knew it was going to be a low-scoring game and just keep possession of the ball and, and go with the safe short stuff. Uh, Watson, 18 of 28, 64.3, 
161 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, 91.5 passer rating. Uh, so are you feeling good about where he's at right now? Better, yeah. I mean, each game has been better than the last. And so we'll see what comes up. Of course, I guess we're going to have, you know, below zero temperatures this weekend. But good, let him play in that. And then you get to uh, you go to uh, Washington and Pittsburgh for the last two uh, in January. Yeah, I want to see what it looks like. But I'm uh, and remember, I was not a big Watson apologist or anything like that. But also, we evaluate him on how he's playing, and it looks pretty good to me right now. And so we'll we'll see what comes next. But to sit there and evaluate in front of your television set, you don't take into consideration the conditions. Uh, it's just like I don't like uh, Cade York like pulling the like pulling these kicks foul as they say like a baseball player. Now that had nothing to do with the win. That was him. But the fact that Justin Tucker missed a kick and a, a straight on kick and so did uh, Cade York. It was it was hard to kick. It was hard to throw. Uh, in fact, I saw John Harbaugh said at uh, his press conference, I think on Monday, that he wishes he had run the ball even more. Yeah, and that that has got to be – that might be the toughest stadium to kick in in the NFL this time mm-hmm. of year when it's windy. I'm trying to think of other places that, that move Pittsburgh, the ball like Pittsburgh that. Pittsburgh is hard. There's something weird about Pittsburgh. The one end especially is real bad. But there's there no lake. Many. You know, the lake makes no. it a really tough equation to solve. I mean, I hope one day we're not just saying we're waiting for the next Phil Dawson, but we're still waiting for the next Phil Dawson. Now, that said, I am not going to want to run Cade York out of town or anything like that. You drafted this guy, work with him. Several kickers, including Phil Dawson, have been cut earlier in their career. And you talked about this and written about it, Terry. A kicker's first year is usually just the beginning, and they get better as they as they go on. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I, mean, um, I don't know. I don't know how you could prepare for Cleveland when you play at LSU or like Phil Dawson played at Texas. You're you're not ready for that. They bring. I mean, Cybert played at Oklahoma. You know, you bring these guys in. Uh, Gonzalez, who's actually had turned out to have a nice NFL career. What where did he play? Arizona or somewhere and. Um, you know, so it's a uh, this is this is puts a, a lot of strain on the kicker, and I do wish that there were just better coaching for kickers in the NFL. And NFL kickers will tell you they're just they don't hire cult kicking consultants or something. I don't know why not. They got consult. They got forty seven guys running around those practices, and and some some ladies now too working on different things. So. Why yeah, not usually just just go out and make it. That's pretty much yeah, that's about it. Yeah, it. yeah. So Terry, I wanted to ask you before we move on here. A few weeks ago, you were writing that the Browns should move on from Joe Woods. That it's time to give this defense a new uh, leader. Uh, the Browns went out on Saturday. They gave up three points, but mm-hmm. 198 rushing yards. Did do you think this helped Joe Woods's case, or in your mind, did it did it change how you feel at all? It didn't change how I feel, then it should not help his case. I mean, I, granted, they didn't collapse, but it still was a lot of yards on the ground. And I'm just, I've seen enough. That's all. I just I don't want to go through it again. Uh, I don't want to go through year four of Joe Woods. And of course, that discussion with his um, uh, Howard, the Jeff Howard, the uh, defensive backs coach, that was that was pretty disturbing, really where he talked about how, well, they were surprised when T. Higgins and Boyd didn't play, so therefore it's only going to be Jamar Chase. And it's like, are you kidding me? This is your chance to just slam down this guy. Burrow threw 33 passes through 15 to Chase. I think after about pass seven or eight, uh, that had to be prime double coverage. And, okay, yeah, they hit a couple other guys for some long gains, but still – it was just an odd discussion. And all you had to do in those situations where you're the position, we have to do a better job. We should have done a better job. Uh, in retrospect, we could have done things differently. I don't want to get into it. Um, and that's it. Instead of, like, talking all over the place, it was incomprehensible. And the, I'll tell you the other thing. Maybe it isn't that way when he talks to the players. But I got some emails from fans, and I tend to agree. Go, this guy, the way he came across, no wonder why they're confused. 
my my thing always when you have a situation like that, why I wanted to fire Woods is it would have done two things. Number one is at midseason, you would have taken away the excuse that we have a bad defensive coordinator. Okay, guys, you got a new voice. And number two, then you'd be able to evaluate your personnel because the temptation always is to say, well, if we just get a guy in here with a new scheme, all this will be fine. Well, I don't think it will be fine, but this would be a better way to find out. All right. Well, the Browns are back at it on Saturday, Christmas Eve, another Saturday game against the Saints. It's going to, like you said, Terry, it's going to be another below zero wind chill. I think 10 below wind chill from what I've seen. Oh, great. And so that'll be, it'll be a treat. We'll both be down there. So, But we'll we will our, be in the press box. We will, so, but we still have to walk from the lake. To the, it. Yeah, we'll yeah. be, we'll be in the elements for a bit anyway. This would be one of those things that go, this, once again, this is why they invented television. You could watch it at home. <laughs> All right, Terry, the Guardians, um, it's hot stove season, and I, I wanted to bring up something that you wrote about Mike Zanino, the new catcher the other day. This was some interesting research you found on a website, PubMed.com, which is a medical website, and it was research on 27 pitchers who had this TOS surgery, which has which knocked him out um, after an all-star season. And they found in this study that 74% of professional pitchers who had surgery for this TOS thoracic outlet syndrome, they're able to return and play at the MLB level. And that the majority of their metrics were unchanged from before the surgery. So, and you wrote this, but it looks like the guardians might've gotten a pretty good medical report on this and that was one reason they decided to take the plunges because it, w- what this study suggests is that he might be able to return to what he was yes is that a realistic it, expectation i think so i mean i i was trying to find somebody who wasn't a pitcher who had it there's a guy named walsh from the angels he just had it recently but i think he's a first baseman or athlete or something but they don't have there were no numbers on guys that were not uh, pitchers. So it's an odd throw, and it's not his throwing. I remember it's his left arm. He throws with his right. Now, he does swing right handed, which means that left arm is the one that um, controls the bat. You get a lot of power. But I can see why they did. I mean, look, Austin Hedges, didn't he just get $5 million from Pittsburgh? Yes. What a country. <laughs> it's a good place to be a catcher. Yeah, well, it America. just is. You know, catcher, <laughs> left handed pitcher, you know, those kind of things. It's hard to find them. So it's it's a it's a good gamble. I, I think they're going to look around for their next Luke Maley, another one of these guys on a minor league deal that they could bring in uh, just in case. Because maybe this guy goes to spring training and it doesn't go well. I mean, they're 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 optimistic as Zanino, but we don't know. All right. So I think last week, Terry, I thought we we kind of did this, but not really. And I I wanted to kind of run through. It's opening day, and you're Terry Francona, and you've got to make out the lineup card. And I I just wanted to get this on the record for fans. What is your opening day lineup as of right now? Okay. Because um, I was well, interested in the in the the in who you had where because of, and you know Tito loves to go left, right, left, right. Yeah. So yeah, let's hear. It. What would you do? Yeah, so Quan bats first because it doesn't matter who he faces. Rosario bat second. He's much better against lefties, but he's he's my number two hitter. Then Jose is third. Bell is fourth. Back to back switch hitters. Then you come up with Oscar, or uh, I would go with uh, uh, Naylor. Naylor fifth. Oscar sixth because I want to go protect the left and then the right. Then also what you got? What you got with Zanino? Who else am I forgetting? Um, you know, so you, you have, whoever your DH, if you DH Naylor, then you're going to go with, uh, oh, you know, I would go with, uh, yeah, I would go to Oscar six. I would go him in a seventh because there's your left-handed hitter. Um, you know, Zanino and I keep, I must be forgetting somebody else. Uh, Miles DH'ing. Straw. Miles Straw. Yeah, Straw's ninth. Yeah, so there you go. There's Zanino, nice, Straw. But he seems to like Straw, ninth, and then roll up into uh, the other guys because Straw can draw some walks and, and, and do that. So that's, you know, if they have, if Zanino can play, he's above average defensively. He's not great, but he's good. And then you, you have, um, I think Rosario's at least average at short. Uh, Jimenez is gold glove at second. And then you have Straw, who's, uh, people get on him. I mean, this guy's stats in center field are elite defensively. I mean, they, he saves a ton of runs. 
So you're strong up the middle there. You know, Jose's pretty good at third. Uh, Bell's okay at first. And Juan is tremendous in left field. And Oscar is very underrated in right. It's a good defensive team. So I was interested that you put uh, Jimenez seventh in that lineup. Mm -hmm. Breakout season last year. Is there any, did you entertain maybe putting him higher? I thought about maybe putting him second, but, you know, it seemed like it just was working up there with Rosario. That's all. Um, no other, no other reason. And you could always switch it around. Of course, see, Jimenez plays hard too. I mean, he comes at you, he steals bases, he runs hard. I just love the way Rosario and Jose are like attacking the base pass back to back. And Quan does too. That's a nice thing. If you think about their, their, their way they, the guys that can run, Straw could run, but he, doesn't get on much. You know, Quan can run. Rosario could run. Jose is amazing. He looks at me and think he wouldn't be able to run at all, but he can run. And Jimenez steals bases. So it's uh, it's really nice. You know, Oscar hits a ton of doubles. Once he gets rolling, uh, he's pretty quick. So, I mean, they're fun. They're just, I'm looking forward to it. And this is a lineup like last year, Terry, that'll put, that puts pressure on the opposing defense, like in a number of ways. And if they get some more pop, uh, with Bell and Zanino, Zanino it's going to mm-hmm. be an interesting season again. So, well, interesting. the more balls, the more, you know, Francona says, you know, at least when we hit the ball and put it in play, it gives us a chance. So, now, uh, Zanino, by the way, he strikes out a lot. I mean, you just have, that's going to come with the package. I don't think the surgery is going to change that. Uh, so, speaking of Jimenez, Terry, uh, and Paul Hoynes and Joe Noga, our Guardians reporters, have written about this. But he's playing shortstop to get ready for the World Baseball mm-hmm. Classic. And we've seen over the years in Cleveland guys playing in this World Baseball Classic. They either get hurt or they, you know, they, the pitchers go too hard too early. Um, what do you think of Jimenez playing short? Are you okay with that? And do you have any concerns about what this might do to the start of the season for him? I don't worry too much about position players. I do with pitchers. I remember when uh, Andrew Miller pitched in it, Francona kept talking to us about uh, background about Vinny, Pist- Vinny Pistano. Remember him, Vinny mm-hmm. Pistano? And he he really he hurt himself in the world games and never was the same after that. And Francona had a couple other guys that that happened to, but they all were pitchers. Uh, he wasn't too concerned about uh, uh, about the position players. So I guess I'll stay in that. And a lot of those guys would play in the winter leagues and everything else. And I believe him and as I might be playing a little bit this winter. I'm not positive on that. So with him, no, but if I would not want – really, if I were running a team, I wouldn't send him any pitchers. Or I would send them, you know, my third, you know, Connor Pilkington or somebody, you know, guys from AAA that might pitch a little bit here that you just kind of maybe just want them to even get some more innings. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. And and, and Chris Antonetti and the, the front office have talked about this. Like, these guys want to play for their countries. Yeah. And it, it, there's some places where this means a lot, more than mm-hmm. it does in the U.S. in a lot yeah, of ways. And it's like you don't want to deprive them of that chance. But at the same time, you got 162 games to play. And it's it's a tough balance. And they're going to try and strike it. But By the way, you know, Jose now, you got to make sure that he's healed from that it was a thumb surgery. Right. Uh, that would be That would be the only – caveat about a position player playing would be uh, if he's coming off surgery or something all right well we got some more hot stove stuff we'll be talking about uh this winter here it's uh, it's always entertaining to see the moves that are made and uh, paul hoines wrote on sunday about uh, i think he called it the tsunami of money that's yeah. flying around major league baseball so we'll be keeping track of all that too all right you ready for some hey terry questions sure All right, this one is from Andy Getz. He's from Denver, and he says, Hey, Terry, I really enjoy following the Cavaliers, and it's great to see them doing well so far this season. I watched their recent nationally televised game against the Lakers, which was a great win, but Charles Barkley mentioned at halftime that the Cavaliers' Achilles heel is their bench. While I don't always agree with Barkley, I tend to agree with him on Mm -hmm. this point. Kevin Love has not looked good since his thumb injury. Karis LeVert and Jetty Osman have been inconsistent, and Isaac Okoro has been a disappointment. I cringe every time he attempts a three-pointer. It will help greatly when Ricky Rubio and Dean Wade come back from their injuries, but I'm wondering whether there's enough on this bench to sustain the Cavaliers when they get into tougher games in the playoffs. What do you think? Well, first of all, you cut your bench down in the playoffs. In fact, in some of the big games here, if you really look at it, 
JV's playing eight guys. Uh, I think that will expand when Rubio's ready to go. I want to see what it looks like with Rubio. I just do. I think that he will help get everybody feeling better. Um, the Love's thumb injury, I believe it's a, it's a thumb, isn't it? It's a hand anyway, a hairline fracture somewhere. Um, that's been a big, big deal to it because he's not shooting the ball right. Uh, he's playing, but he's not not really shooting this as well. Um, Levert is the guy who's talented enough to give them fairly consistent production off the bench. Uh, Chetty Osmond's always going to be the same thing. You don't know what it is. You leave him out there for a little while, see which way it's going, and don't leave him out there too long. Um, that's it, it, It's kind of like he's a minor league Sexton in that regard. You, you want to see what you have, but he could be very explosive and – and that kind of stuff, but that you can't rely on him. I, I tend to agree. I think it's a fairly good, it's a fairly good point. Uh, Rubio, I, I really believe is going to help it though. Yeah. And that'll be happening in January. It sounds like so. Mm-hmm. All right, Terry, this is kind of a related question. It's from longtime friend of the podcast, Kathleen Thompson. And she says, hi, Terry, what are your thoughts about Karis Levert as a score? I thought he would be better. Um, and just for background here, I, I'll give his stats real quick. Terry, yeah. 12.1 points a game. 39.3% shooting, 4.3 rebounds, right 4.1 assists, and he's 35.3% on three-pointers. <sighs> What's your from the foul line? I don't have that, but I can find okay. it. Yeah. A couple thoughts. 39% for where he takes shots is too low. 39% is too low, period, but it really is. And I want him going to the rim more now. I was surprised he's up to 35 on threes. I will say this, his passing is better than I thought it would be. Um, He does try defensively. But this guy has averaged 18 to 20 at different points in his career. Uh, I don't really know. And I wonder in his mind if he's concerned. He's on the last year of a contract. Will he be traded? Um, If I become a free agent, my numbers are down. You know, these guys, they're businessmen too. So, But he is the one guy, and Kathleen's right, that uh, I expected more from. Yeah, and this was interesting, Terry. He, he's shooting 35% from the field at home and 44% on the road. And usually it's the opposite for guys. Uh, that was mm-hmm. a pretty pretty big discrepancy there. Um, he is shooting 76% on free throws. Yeah, he should be better than that. By the way, one of the things about Mitchell, how about he's making almost 90% of those free throws? It's something. I mean, you know, I think Chris had, he's could be a... a, a a 90, 50, 40 guy, you know, 90 from the foul line, 50 from the field, 40 on threes. Um, I remember that was one of the reasons that Chris Grant was absolutely in love with Kyrie Irving as first year at Duke, the year at Duke. He either had that or was very close to 90, 50, 40. That's an impressive triple right there. Yeah. It's like a triple crown baseball or yeah. something. Yeah. All right, Terry, this last one is from another longtime friend of the pod, Jack and Erie. And Jack, I'm going to change the names here because I don't want to I don't want to put anybody out in the spotlight here. He says, hey, Terry, I know this is a sports show, but I hope you can help me here. For the first time in my life, I'm hosting Christmas. We lost my favorite aunt and uncle over the past two years. Their kids who are teens now will be coming over. Do I bring up Uncle Larry and Aunt Carrie? How do we approach this? We're so lucky to still have family around, but I would love to hear your advice on this. Yeah, I would. I would say, what are your favorite memories of that aunt and uncle? Unless there's something, you know, in their background. I mean, look, if the family was a mess, then that's a different deal. But if they were pretty good people, yeah, let's let's tell good stories about them. Um, that's the way to to remember them and to acknowledge that they're not there and that they're being missed. I suppose. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Don't pretend. I mean, to, to pretend that chair is empty and it doesn't matter. You know, even if there's somebody sitting there, because especially if they get together every year and people sit at certain spots at the table, and then a person's not there. Um, let's do it that way. And yeah, it's sad, but it's also uh, the old thing. You could laugh through the tears, too. I'm sure there's some good stories about them, but that's what I would do. Um, I mean, I, I know that uh, one of the things I wrote for the holidays is like, make sure you deal with the oldest first because you don't know who you will not have next year granted you know hey we're all day to day but for some people it feels like minute to minute yeah and that does feel like the right approach to me too terry like you you 
they're missed, you should acknowledge it and you should remember the the good moments. And it's a, it's a nice way to spend a mm-hmm. holiday, nice part of the part of the holiday anyway. So, Jack, thanks for sending that in. All right, Terry, do you have a book recommendation for this week? It's a, it's, a, it's an older one. And it's gotten some traction lately with a documentary and all that. But I'll tell you, The Pitch That Killed by Mike Soul is really good. The Pitch That Killed about Ray Chapman. Um, I really did enjoy that for a, a sports book. And if you want to read, read a book about when the Browns actually won the title. Brownstown, 1964. The who only, wrote that one, Terry? The guy who's named after a former planet that was kicked out of the planetary <laughs> thing. I mean, that was really a bad – you talk about a Russian election in there. Only like 20% of certified astronomers voted in that to kick Pluto out of the solar system or whatever they did. You should have but hired yeah, an, an army of lawyers to push I back. I should on. have. But, yeah, the, the pitch that killed, I was thinking about that. It's a, and that's one that you can find pretty easily. and. You know, just a whole different thing. One of the interesting parts about the 20 Indians, and this was something that before that book came out, I remember I wrote a story on them, was how they're the big debate on can they actually have a World Series in 1920 that's not fixed. Remember that. One year and, after the Black Sox game, yeah. wasn't it? Yep. So one of the things that that went through without any big stories or any any doubt about that. And, of course, uh, remember, Cleveland only wins a World Series when they have a playing manager. That's right. For speaker and Lou Boudreau. Time for Tito to put the uh, spikes back on. Yeah, go on there, pinch hit a few times That's like right. Frank Robinson did. So, <laughs> All right. Hey, um, real quick, you, Terry, you mentioned your books. Books are a great gift. And if you want to check out all of Terry's, you can find them all at terrypluto.com. Also, here's your weekly reminder. If you want to subscribe, a subscription to cleveland.com is a great idea. You can, the easiest way to do it, just go to cleveland.com slash Browns. There's a blue banner at the top. You can subscribe, get everything on the website for free. Plus, you get a Browns newsletter every morning, and you can sign up for texting from our Browns reporters, and that's all included in the subscription. So that helps support journalism, and we appreciate it if you can do that. I think that's it, Terry. We good? I am, I am all set. All right. I will see you down at the game on Saturday. Everybody, have an awesome Christmas. Have an awesome Hanukkah. Awesome. Any holidays that you celebrate this holiday season, we hope you have a wonderful time. I have a public service announcement oh. before we leave. All right, let's hear it. As someone who once upon a time, the pipes burst when it was cold. Really? As the weekend comes, turn on the little water, let it trickle through because you do not want cold burst pipes. So what happened? How bad was it? It was, when, very, was when, when we lived in Savannah a long time ago, but it happened to our neighbor. And it was bad. Your water's off for several days because oftentimes when it gets this cold, a lot of people don't do that. Their pipes burst and the plumbers are way too busy and it's way too expensive. Where else are you going to get advice? That's right. You get sports talk, family advice, and and books and plumbing all Mm -hmm. on Terry's Talking. (laughs) We'll catch you next time, everybody. Have a great weekend and we'll talk to you soon.